Amen. All right, open your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Finally, we will finish up this letter today. Uh, we're going to look at verses 11 through 21. So the rest of uh, chapter 6, the rest of this letter. Now remember, this is the first of three letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to two uh, church leaders, two to Timothy and one to Titus. And we're finishing up this one, um, the first letter, the pastoral epistles today. And uh, Lord willing, we'll begin the second letter to Timothy next week. And uh, so remember last time uh, Paul was talking, uh, again, giving instructions, more pastoral instructions to young Timothy on how to deal with and care for the church. And uh, he had more instructions on dealing with false teachers. And uh, as we pick this up, he, we're going to see that he makes this uh, dramatic shift. So let's look at verses 11 through 21. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be glory and eternal dominion. Amen. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. O Timothy, Guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. And so we see Paul is ending now this, this first letter and making this drastic change. And again, remember back in verse 9 of chapter 6, to the end, or to verse 10, he, he continues to give these instructions uh, concerning the false teachers. He says, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. So he's continuing to teach about the motivation for the false teachers, that they have a love for money and they want to get rich and they fall into this snare. But he makes this shift. He says in verse 11, but as for you, makes this dramatic shift from the false teachers to now young Timothy. And he says, oh man of God, this is a a, a, a designation that was given to other people, other men in the Bible. It was given to Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 1. It was given to Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 6. It was given to Elijah in 1 Kings 17, 18, and to David in Nehemiah 12, 24. So Timothy was in good company with the rest of the men in, in the Scripture and so Paul makes this shift and he says, but as for you, you know, and I can almost see him pointing his finger as he's writing and he's, he's, he's thinking about Timothy, but as for you, oh, oh man of God. And, and so he gives some instruction to young Timothy. Um, the Bible uses this phrase, oh man of God, to, uh, to, to point to an individual who represents God 
in proclaiming his word. And so by calling Timothy a man of God, Tim, Paul was reminding Timothy that he was called, that he was ordained, and that he was responsible to preach the word of God. As a matter of fact, in the second letter, the way that he ends his second letter, which is his final word, and we'll start talking about that next week, he has this big diatribe of, 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 uh, of commanding Timothy to preach the word. And so here he's reminding Timothy that he is a man of God and that he's called, he's ordained, he's responsible to preach the word of God. And so here in these first few verses, Paul gives four instructions for the man of God. First of all, in the first part of verse 11, he says, flee. So he tells Timothy to run away. Now, there are times in, in, in life when running away is seen as an act of weakness. But there are other times, as we see here in the scripture, that running away is seen as an act of wisdom. Uh, there are some examples in scripture, just a couple of them. We remember that in uh, Genesis chapter 39, Joseph fled from Potiphar's wife when she tried to seduce him. She got the, or he got the heck out of there so quick that he slipped out of his, his garment and she was holding on to it. And David fled from King Saul when he tried to kill him. As a matter of fact, David spent many years fleeing from King Saul when really David could have taken Saul's life, but he didn't. There was a couple of occasions when he had the perfect opportunity, and even his men tried to convince him to do so, and he didn't. He fled away from there. And so this is the case that Paul is instructing Timothy to do here. And the word flee here has the idea of separating himself. So we ask, separating himself from what? He says, but as for you, O man of God, flee these things. He points back, talking about, to, talking about the things that he was talking about, uh, the, the, the false teachers, the pride of what they thought they knew in, in verse 4, the, the craving for uh, controversy and the love of money. He says, you, Timothy, you're not to do these things. You're to run away from these things. You're to flee from these things. These false teachers were perverting the gospel for personal gain. And Paul was telling Timothy, you can't do that. You're to run away from those things. And then secondly, he says in the second part of verse 11, he says he is to run towards something. He says, notice what he says. He says, pursue uh, Warren Wearsby says this. He says, separation without positive growth becomes isolation. And, and listen, I've seen that. I just had a conversation with a man uh, Sunday morning after church on this very uh, subject. Separation without positive growth becomes isolation, and that's not a good thing. And so Paul here gives, gives Timothy and, and us some good instruction. We are to run toward righteousness. Now, this has to do with personal integrity. It has to do with our character. We are to run towards godliness. This has to do with godly living, with having a heart to obey and honor God. So righteousness has to do with our character. Godliness has to do with our conduct. How do we live it out? And then we're to run towards faith. This is a confident trust in God. This develops uh, faithfulness. It develops dependability. We're to run towards love. This is a sacrificial love. This is that agape, God-type love that Paul's talking about here. It's a love of uh, volition, a love of the will, a love of the choice. And it's a love for God, which then in turn develops a love for others. He says that we're to run towards steadfastness. This has to do with endurance. It has the idea of, uh, of the don't quit mentality. It has the idea of perseverance, of remaining under, not giving up, of keeping on, keeping on, not giving up when the, when the going gets tough. 
And then he says we're to run towards gentleness or meekness. And again, we've heard that meekness is not weakness, but really it's power under control. And so we're to run towards these things. It's humility. And so just as Paul is instructing Timothy to run away from sin and run towards godliness, we are to do the same thing. Run towards holiness. Run towards acting like Christ. And then the third instructions in verses 12 through 16, he gives Timothy the instruction to fight. Look again at verses 12 through 16. He says, fight the good fight of faith, of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. He says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He was the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. He says to Timothy, you're to fight, to fight, to contend for victory. Now the, the word, the, the Greek word is a, is a cool sounding word. I just like the, the, the sound of this word. It's agonizomai. Isn't that cool? Uh, some of those words are just, but it, it has the idea we get our word agonize from this, from this word agonizomai. And And it means to make every effort to achieve the goal. He says to fight the good fight of the faith. And this is a metaphor for the Christian life viewed in terms of faithfulness to Christ. He says fight the good fight. Don't give up. Don't give in to the world around us. But we're to fight that good fight of faith. And one uh, author said this. He said, being a, spokesman, being a spokesman of God calls a man into warfare. Now, that's truth. When you think about this, when we take a stand for righteousness and we take a stand for Jesus Christ and we're not giving up and we're fighting the fight, we better be ready to fight because it calls us into warfare. The Christian life is a constant battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so Paul says to fight the good fight of the faith. He says to take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. Don't become complacent. So many Christians, I think, fall into that. So many, uh, I think, leaders fall into complacency. And and think about this. The encouragement in in, uh, the good fight of faith is the fact that we have eternal life. We have been called by God. We are called by God, and he has promised us eternal life. So in other words, this life ain't all there is. Amen? I mean, our best life is not now. Our best life is waiting for us, and we will be there. We will receive that because we have been called by God, and we have been promised by him who cannot lie to give us eternal life. Uh, 1 Peter 2.9 tells us that he has called us out of the darkness and brought us into his marvelous light. Listen to what Paul wrote in the book of Romans chapter 8 and and verse 30. He says, And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Notice there's no dropouts there. If he calls us, if he has predestined us, he's going to justify us. He has justified us in that calling. And when we come to faith in Christ, he will sanctify us and then eventually will glorify us. Praise God for that. That means we will end up in heaven and we can't do anything to mess that up. That's good news. Amen. I mean, Listen, if it were up to me, I'd have, I'd have done lost it five minutes after I got salvation. But it's not up to us. We have been promised. We have been called by God. 
and we will be in heaven. And so he says to Timothy to take hold of that eternal life to which you have been called. And so as a result of this truth, that we are to live our lives in light of eternity, always looking forward, always looking upward, we are going home someday. And, you know, there are times in, in life that, uh, and I've heard many people talk about this, come Lord Jesus, right? I mean, just come today. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I've heard so many people say that. We are going. And so we're to live our lives in light of that. We will be going home. We will be spending eternity in heaven. And so Paul is reminding Timothy that the man of God has his mind on things above, not on things on this earth, according to Colossians chapter uh, 3 and verse 2. And then he says in verses 13 and 14, he says, I charge you to keep the commandment. The why. He says, I charge you. What does he say in verse 13? In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, God who gives life to all things in Christ Jesus, who made the con good confession uh, before Pontius Pilate. He remained faithful. And think about that. Aren't you thankful that he remained faithful? Aren't you thankful that Jesus didn't go part of the way and say, you know what, this is too tough, man. I'm not going to do it. Or when he was getting whipped and beat or when he was being nailed to the cross, he said, well, hang on a minute, I, this isn't what I signed up for. No, I'm sorry. Or when he was hanging on the cross and, and they were hurling insults at him. He didn't say, I'm done get me down off here, call legions of angels. And he didn't do that. He all the way, he went all the way and praise God for that. And because of that, we have the hope of eternal life. He says, I charge you to keep the commandment in front of God and of Christ Jesus. Think about this. The knowledge of his omniscient and omnipresent scrutiny and perfect standard should motivate the man of God to diligence. God's watching. <laughs> the, the, the Lord knows not only the things that we do, but he knows the things that we're going to do. He knows the content and the intent of our hearts. Now you think about that. That's a good thing, but that's, you know, that's not really a good thing because he knows everything, but he loves us and he has promised us. He has called us out of the darkness and promised us eternal life. And so that should motivate us to diligence in obeying the word of God. He, sell, he tells Timothy to keep the commandment, how? Unstained and free from reproach, meaning to be completely beyond reproach. Our task as Christians, and especially as those that preach and teach the word of God, is to be faithful every day and to abide in him. How long? Until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says. So in other words, keep on keeping on until you go home or Jesus comes back. Timothy was to remain faithful all his life until his death or until Jesus came back. And we're to do the same thing. It's no different for us that we're to remain faithful, we're to keep on keeping on, we're to not give up. So I, I think I heard a wise man say something like this one day. Plow on, <laughs> plow on, plow on, right? Verse 2, plow on, plow on. That's what we're to do. We're to keep on keeping on. And, and then verse 15, he says, talking about his second coming, which he will display at the proper time. Matthew 24, 27, for as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. It's a sure thing, and everybody's going to know it. It's not going to be, well, did he come yesterday? No, no, no. everybody's going to know, and it's a sure thing. It's going to happen when? In the fullness of time, just as Galatians 4, 4. Just as his first coming was in God's perfect timing, his second coming will be in God's perfect timing. Now, we don't know when that is, but we do know that it will be. We can disagree. We can agree to disagree, I guess, 
on the, the particulars of how all that's going to work because I have my ideas and somebody else has their ideas and somebody else has their ideas and how that's all going to work. And we can agree to disagree, and that's okay. But the one thing that we can't disagree on is the fact that he's coming back. Make no mistake about it. He came the first time. He's coming the second time. Amen. He is coming back. And we will be benefited because of that. When he comes back or when we take our last breath, either one that happens, we're going home to be in heaven forever. So praise God for that. He says, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign. And, and so here, you know, that uh, Paul gets into this. Uh, he launches into the, one of those magnificent doxologies of Scripture. He who is the blessed describes his lack of unhappiness, one writer writes. His lack of frustration, his lack of anxiety. He is content, he says, satisfied and at peace and perfectly joyful. He says, while some things please him, and others do not, nothing alters his heavenly contentment. He controls everything to his own joyous ends. Man, that's good news. Amen. That's good truth. Nothing can give him heartburn, right? Who said it last week? It occurred to me that nothing has occurred to God, right? That's an amazing truth that he knows all things. He is the only sovereign, meaning there's only one. He's the only God. He is God alone. Isaiah 43, 13 says, I am he, there is none who can deliver from my hand. He says, I work and who can turn it back? He alone is the sovereign king. He is, as Paul writes here, the king of kings and the Lord of lords who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see to him be glory to him, be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. God is absolutely sovereign and omnipotently rules everything everywhere. And he has no rivals. And one author said this, certainly not Satan, whom he created, cast out of heaven, and sentenced to eternal hell. He is the only sovereign. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, Revelation 17, 14, and 19, 16 give this title to Jesus Christ, and rightly so. But here, I believe that Paul is talking about God the Father because he adds to it whom no one has ever seen or can see. And so he's, he's giving this title, rightly so again, to God the Father. The fact that God is sovereign, in control of all things at all times, above any earthly king or ruler, you think about this, it is the most encouraging and comforting doctrine in all of Scripture. Nothing, no one is above him. He is the king and the Lord. And to him, Paul says, to, to him be honor and eternal dominion. He alone is to be worshipped. Amen. There is no one else. There is nothing else that we should worship, that we should ascribe worship to other than God himself. Now, Paul may have put this in here. Some think that uh, he may have intended to counter uh, emperor worship, which was prevalent in that day in, in the Roman Empire. It was customary. It wasn't out of the ordinary to hear Caesar is Lord. But Paul was, is, is dramatically saying, no, 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 no. God is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. There is only one and he is it. Caesar is not. And then in verses 17 through 19, he, he gives this little aside and he continues to give final instruction uh, for those that are in the congregation of Ephesus. He, he gives this aside and, and continues to instruct the rich, the wealthy in the congregation. He says, as for the rich in this present age. So he gives four instructions concerning the rich. First of all, he says that they are to be humble. He says, charge them not to be haughty. 
Warren Wiersbe said this. He said, if wealth makes a person proud, then he understands neither himself nor his wealth. He says, we are not owners. We are stewards. The possessing of material wealth ought to humble a person and cause him to glorify God and not himself. If we have wealth, it is by the grace of God. It's not because of us. It's not because of, you know, we're all that in a bag of chips. It's because God has allowed us to have that. And the Bible even records that in Deuteronomy 8, 18. It's because of him. So first of all, he gives the instruction to the wealthy in the congregation to be humble, to not be haughty. And then secondly, to, to trust God and not riches. Look again. He says, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Think about this. Riches are uncertain. And we're seeing this play out again in our world uh, after, you know, so many times we see this. But uh, inflation is up and the, and the value of the dollar is down. Riches are uncertain, but God is the most certain trustworthy, faithful security in the whole universe. We could put our trust in him. And Paul is once again giving instruction to Timothy to give instruction to the wealthy in the congregation that they are to trust God and not trust their wealth. And then he says, enjoy what God gives you. Yes, the word enjoy is in the scripture. Ecclesiastes 2.24 says, There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. We are to enjoy this life. We are to enjoy the things that God has given us all for the glory of God. We can have a good time. We can enjoy the things that God has given us. Listen, as hard as this work is, and it is hard, doesn't it bring you joy that we get to do what we get to do? That we, could, we get to live out this life in this world of chaos, knowing that Jesus Christ is Lord, knowing that we have been called out of darkness, knowing that, that he has promised us eternal life, and knowing that we have the cure for sin, and we don't hold it to ourselves, we give it out. We are sowers and scatterers of the seed of life, and we can find joy in that. And God wants us, I believe, to enjoy this life, to enjoy the things that he has given us. And then finally, the final instruction he gives to the wealthy, not only enjoy what God has given you, but employ what God has given you. Look again at verses 18 and 19. He says, they are to do good, to be rich in good works to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. They are to use their wealth, he says, to do good to others. And the effect of that is they're storing up treasures in heaven. You know, um, one of the older gentlemen uh, years ago uh, in my congregation He's gone home to be with the Lord now, but he used to say this. He says, you know, sometimes God doesn't have a problem giving to us, but sometimes he has a problem giving through us. He blesses us so that we can then be a blessing to others. And that's what Paul is saying to Timothy to tell the wealthy in the congregation to employ, to, to, to bless others with what God has blessed them with. And then finally, he closes out this letter I think in a, in, in a personal way. Look at verse 20. Oh, Timothy. You know, in that, it, it, you just hear that, that, that sound of endearment there. You know, Paul calls him his son in the faith. And, and, and you just kind of hear this, that he's talking to his son. Oh, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. And so he is, he is once again encouraging Timothy to not give up and to guard what he's been entrusted with and then to give it out. Think about this. God had committed the truth to Paul, and then Paul had committed the truth to Timothy, and now it was Timothy's responsibility to guard it 
and then to pass it along to others. As a matter of fact, he's going to tell Timothy that in the second letter. And then he says in verse 21, he says, by professing this falsely called knowledge, some have swerved from the faith. And then he ends this letter in, in uh, typical Paul fashion. Grace be with you. Now, in this, in, in this ending here, he's talking to the congregation because the you is plural. So basically what he's saying is grace be with you all. Grace be with you all. So Paul ends this instructional letter. Now, we think that, uh, you know, this was written probably between 62 to 64 A.D., and it was after Paul was released and he was continuing on what they think was his uh, fourth missionary journey. Now, as we begin 2 Timothy, we're going to see uh, the, the circumstances have changed. And, and as we begin 2 Timothy, I want you to start thinking about if you knew that your end was near. And we don't know. I mean, our end could be today or tomorrow. We don't know that. But if you knew your end was near, what would you be saying? That's what we're going to talk about as we get into uh, the, the final words of a dying man. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that you've given us. Thank you for this uh, pastoral letter that, uh, Lord, that you inspired the Apostle Paul to write to young Timothy and to us. Help us, Lord, to, uh, to take these things to heart, to live them out, and then to share them with others. And Father, we'll be sure to give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.